Kumba Balkan, Kumba Nani Gyanju, Uruguri State Library of Queensland Goo, which is good evening, it's good to see you, and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland. Uh, I'm Vicky McDonald, State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland, and on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to this evening's Game Changers event. I begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. At State Library of Queensland, we are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a really warm welcome to our guest speaker this evening, Alex Drayling, co-founder and CEO of ClipChamp, our facilitator, Professor Marek Kalkovich, a member of the Library Board of Queensland and also founding director of the Centre for the Digital Economy at QUT. Courtney Talbot, Vice President of the Queensland Library Foundation Council and members of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame uh, Induction Committee. I also welcome our founding partner and QUT Business School and generous sponsors, picture partners, Channel 7 and Morgans. And of course, um, extend a very warm um, welcome to my colleague or partner, uh, Professor Amanda Goodmanson, for, uh, Pro Executive Dean of Business and Law at QUT. Fantastic to have you here, Amanda and also friends and supporters of the um, event. It's fantastic to have so many of you here this evening watching here in the auditorium, but also online. And it is also terrific to be welcoming you back to State Library at South Bank for tonight's event. I'd like to acknowledge QUT for generously hosting our first Game Changers for 2022 when we were undergoing flood recovery work earlier this year. This past few years have certainly been very challenging, but complex times can present unique opportunities for creative risk-taking and innovation, and that's what Game Changers is all about. This year, State Library of Queensland celebrates 120 years of service to the people of Queensland. And in that time, film and video technology has changed enormously. From the precious 16 millimetre home reels of Edgar Tolmy, who documented life in Queensland in the 1940s, to the digital James C. Suris collection of artist interviews, State Library's film and video collections are an invaluable part of the Queensland story. The amateur films in our collections and digitised through our Grill Rescue initiative unearth important glimpses of our shared history, such as rare footage of Brisbane's first rock and roll band, The Rockettes. The Queensland Library Foundation is a founding partner of the Hall of Fame and supports Game Changers and many other important projects and services. Our current end of year fundraising campaign is seeking to raise funds for an important activity such as Real Rescue, a long-term campaign to enable digitisation of vulnerable films and videos in our collections. With more than 4,000 images, uh, moving image, image items held in our collections, we are moving the collection to the 21st century and sharing it with the world through our digitisation program. So please do encourage making a tax deductible donation at this time of the year to the foundation and that will help us to continue the work to preserve the state's unique history and culture, including our precious film collections for future generations. Now, Game Changers is a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame initiative, a partnership between QUT Business School, State Library and the Queensland Library Foundation. And it brings together great minds from business, technology and creative industries who've had the courage to take a risk on a bold idea. Our Game Changer this evening helped build and launch a powerful video editing tool for people to continue to document and share their stories through the moving image. Alex Drayling was born in East Germany and as a talented swimmer had his sights set on the Olympics before the fall of the Berlin Wall. After a stint in New York, he eventually settled in Brisbane. In 2017, Alex and his co-founders built and launched ClipChamp, a free video editing application that is used by 17 million editors across the world. In September 2021, US tech giant Microsoft made ClipChamp their first Australian acquisition in over a decade. And I think that's what we're going to hear a little bit about this evening. And tonight, Alex will be joined by Professor Marek Kalkovich, who will facilitate tonight's discussion. Marek joined QUT from Silicon Valley, where he led innovation teams of one of the largest enterprise software vendors in the world. He has extensive experience in conducting research, co-innovating with industry and university partners, 
and delivering innovative products to the market. Marek is the founding director of the Centre for the Digital Economy and he leads QUT's research agenda to inform and influence a robust digital economy in Australia. This conversation is being broadcast on State Library of Queensland's live stream page. You'll be able to watch it later on the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame webpage and on State Library's Facebook page. So this evening we'll be using Slido to collect questions from both online viewers and people within the auditorium. So if you go to slido.com and enter the code uh, hash QBLHOF or simply scan the QR code that appears on the screen throughout the event. So Marek will do his best to get to as many questions as possible and I think the exciting thing about Slido is you can vote for questions, so questions will go to the top. So vote for the questions that you particularly like. If you're sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, please use the hashtag QBLHOF. Following this evening's discussion, I'd also invite you to check out our latest exhibition in the auditorium, The Great and Grand Rumpus, and we've opened the SLQ gallery a little longer so that you can explore that tonight. And if you're feeling particularly creative, you can join our Hack the Evening event that will be in the, um, in the gallery as well with uh, Great and Grand Rumpus. But for now, enjoy the conversation and uh, invite Marek and Alex to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky, for this uh, introduction. Uh, good uh, evening, everyone, uh, those in the room as well as uh, uh, online. Alex, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. Well, um, thank, thank you for the invite and for that very nice remark at the beginning. And I'm sure it'll be an exciting conversation. Before we get started, I wanted to also welcome our Oslan interpreters uh, and uh, appreciate the hard work that they're going to uh, be performing. Uh, let's remember the two of us were born uh, in, in Eastern Europe and so our accents are probably sometimes not the easiest to follow. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you ahead of time. Um, I really encourage you to ask questions through Slido. Uh, we will formally uh, look at them every now and then, uh, but we might also basically just uh, sometimes get inspired by what we're seeing on a screen here. Uh, so please, uh, please feel free to uh, influence this conversation as much as you want. If you need to leave early, please uh, uh, use the door at the back. Uh, so go slightly upstairs and, uh, and use the door uh, over, um, over there behind uh, us. Uh, but with this introduction, let me just get straight to the topic. And uh, Alex, I think it's fair if, uh, first of all, you tell all of us, uh, what is ClipChamp? Yeah, ClipChamp is the world's first and only, to, at least to our knowledge, only fully in-browser video editing platform. Uh, it's a very important technological differentiation that maybe is not so interesting tonight, but what it led to is really a user explosion um, that we were able to drive as a startup. And Nat was insanely helpful in putting a bunch of screenshots about what ClipChamp has been throughout the years. So there's a few that were a bit older from uh, back from 2018 and a few that are a bit newer. Um, so effectively, we allow anyone to tell stories worth sharing. Um, through video and that you can use your own assets, uh, stock assets, um, uh, whatever you want in order to put a video together um, that expresses uh, a story that you want to tell. Um, before the acquisition, we went all the way up to about 20 million registered users uh, and, well, we're not going to get smaller from, from there, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, um, I, I shared this with you a, a few months ago when, when I was getting a, a new, new computer for my daughter who was starting her high school and I clicked on the start button and, uh, and noticed uh, ClipChamp uh, uh, there as one of the uh, default applications that Microsoft suggests to the users to, uh, to start using. I wanted to ask you about your teenage years, you know, imagine yourself uh, or remember yourself uh, at a swimming pool in Leipzig, in East Germany, at a starting block, and you know, doing, I'm assuming, your daily uh, swimming uh, drills. What were your thoughts back then? You know, have you, you know, have you even thought that you know, software could be your future? Of course. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, so first of all, I had that same uh, experience that Marek had. Um, I was waiting for a new computer, and with the ship shortage, it just didn't come in. So uh, I went to UMart, bought a gaming PC, and it took me about a day to set it up. And then when I finally opened the start menu, there was ClipChamp. Um, it's not unusual for a computer that I have to have ClipChamp on, but in this case, I was like, hold on. I just picked this up from a retailer. How cool is that? Um, so uh, yeah, but, but back to those pool days in, in Germany. Um, so when I was younger, I, uh, well, Eastern Germany, we were kind of locked in. So for those of you who um, uh, remember those times, there was a Berlin Wall that was kind of impenetrable from our end. <laughs> and, um, and one of the ways to get out was effectively to do sports. So uh, at a very young age, uh, my parents, uh, you know, had all these books of these great places everywhere in the world, and they were just basically, um, yeah, out of reach. So sports for me was always going to be, um, you know, there was a, a 92 Olympics and a 96 Olympics in Barcelona and Atlanta, and I thought, like, that's the way to travel, so I'm just going to try that. Um, that led to every single day starting at 7 o'clock, uh, two and a half hours worth of training, and then uh, a whole school day, and then from 4.30 to uh, 6.30, another two hours of training. So as a kid, four and a half hours of training every single day. And um, of course, you don't think about tech. Uh, you're counting tiles and you're singing. I mean, what else are you going to do when you <laughs> swim that much? Um, what it taught me, though, is that it's a lot of hard work. Like, no matter what you want to achieve, um, it's a lot of hard work. You end up at competitions uh, every single a uh, week, uh, you can't possibly win all of them, so you win some, you lose some, but you keep going. And I think it's been uh, very instructional, very foundational um, to the way I'm thinking as those years in the pool. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I didn't get to where I wanted to be, but I'm very thankful that I had that experience. Mm -hmm. I just wanted for everyone to, to pause and reflect on the, the differences in, in, in the, our approaches to travel between Alex's teenage years, where you basically had to be among you know, the top five, ten people in the country to be able to go to Barcelona, and us now being able to just pull out a phone and, uh, and, and book a trip to Barcelona just like that. A very, very different times. But uh, I found it fascinating the first time we talked about um, that, that influence and the sort of how you can um, apply lessons from sports uh, to, to entrepreneurship. Uh, so, so tell us a bit more about the, the history of uh, ClipChamp. How much did it take you from the sort of the launch of ClipChamp until it was, uh, how long did it take uh, until it was um, acquired? And, and, and share that story with us, you know, how was it? Yeah, 3,120 days. Um, <laughs> I looked it up before. So uh, we, we founded the company in February 2012, uh, 2013, uh, and this, uh, the sale closed in August 2021, so uh, 3,120 days. Um, so we set out to build the biggest distributed supercomputer in the world, and in fact, the holding company of what we uh, sold at the end was called Zetfas PTY Limited. So Zeta Flop as a Service. Um, that was effectively what we wanted to do. Um, so, Alex, it had nothing to do with videos, correct? Ish. Um, so, uh, we built video technology that you could distribute uh, and use people who browse the web um, as, a, as a resource in a distributed supercomputer. And we built video technology. Effectively, we wanted to cut video into pieces, distribute it out to people. They would transcode it and then it's a bit technological. It's, it's a big distributed com supercomputer, and um, uh, that didn't work. So we, we went to Steve Baxter uh, very early on. That was before he was a shark. And we pitched the whole thing to him. We called it distributed supercomputing. He called it malware. Um, we thought, like, OK, well, we're not going to get any funding here today. Um, he made some very, very valid points in that we were chasing a three-sided market back then. And so uh, for those of you who use Uber or Airbnb, they're two-sided markets. And just developing a three-sided was a, just a tiny bit too complicated. Um, so we scaled back and we used all the video technology that we built to launch transcodecentral.com. 
Um, and that didn't get any traction either, but uh, probably not because of the name. Um, and then we, relaun we relaunched, we renamed it to clipchamp.com. Uh, no one was interested in that either. Uh, and then we did a bunch of growth hacks, and finally the last one uh, where we brought the application into the Google Chrome web, st web store, all of a sudden saw this user explosion. Um, but that was the journey, like it was a, a journey of relentless change. We had, um, uh, we did four fundamental pivots effectively, um, where we uh, changed the direction of the company quite substantially um, before we ended up on what ClipChamp is today in 2017, 2018. What made you stick to it? Is it the, is it the swimming days? Is it the, the mindset of a, of a swimmer? I just want to eat. Why didn't you give up halfway a, through? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, and so for those of you who like, uh, so if you're in startup land and you've raised capital before, you're asking people to open their checkbooks, give you, uh, you know, primarily like angel investors, very often after tax money. And you go like, yeah, we're gonna build something amazing with it. Um, that's a hard pitch. Now what's even harder is if a year later you show up and you say, right, remember what we sold you last year, which was gonna be the best thing ever? Um, well, it turns out it wasn't, but now we know what the best thing ever was and we just need a bit more of your money, right? That's incredibly difficult. Um, I don't know why we stuck to it. I, I, think, it's, I think we were stubborn and, um, and we just wanted to see this through. We also, in the very first investment round, uh, we had a lot of, um, friends and family um, people amongst our investor base, and it just felt soul crushing to go back to them and say, look, we have to shelf this and, and restart something. Uh, yeah, just mentally disassociate yourself from the investment that you made last year. Um, yeah, so I think that was the endurance and the perseverance that I've, I've learned early on is, is really, um, you know, what, uh, what at least made me stick around and, uh, and, and our co-founders as well. We had long, hard discussions about the journey, right? We had crises discussions at 3 a.m. in the Pancake Manor about, you know, does, does it make sense what we're doing here? Should we do something else? You know, why did we throw our careers away? Um, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster. And what they say in startup land is, uh, you know, everything that feels good in, in normal life feels much, much better in startup land and everything that's bad in real life or normal life feels much, much worse in startup land. So it, it, you go from one to the other constantly. How much uh, of this uh, stubbornness, in a, in a positive sense, how much of this stubbornness do you attribute to the um, uh, relative diversity of your co-founders team? So the fact that you know you have a, a techie person, you have a person who understands sales, you have a vi you're a visionary person, and you know there's, there's, there's quite a few different uh, skills there. Do you think that was also important, that sort of the differences between you? And, and if you wanted to, to tell everyone uh, about your co-founding team as well. Yeah, that definitely played something. So we had uh, four co-founders. We have one very technical uh, co-founder, Zoran Balko, our CTO. Uh, myself, I was more on the vision side. I've got computer science and business degrees, but I haven't coded a single line uh, for ClipChamp. Um, we had Dave Hewitt, who was on the commercial side, sales side, and Toby Raub, who was uh, on the operational side. And yes, we all had different strengths. Um, it's like the, the things that prompt you to potentially give up is events that happen that you potentially do not know a solution for. But because we were quite a, a diverse uh, founding team, you know, if it was a technical, technical challenge, then Zern was just like, as he heard it, processing, and you could barely hold him back from the keyboard to start coding, right? Um, if it was anything else, one of us usually had an idea on how to overcome this. I do think that makes a big difference. Mm. Uh, and I would just encourage anyone who wants to be on an entrepreneurial journey, find yourself some co-founders who you trust, who you can work with, treat it like a marriage. You're gonna be having a very close relationship with them for a long time. Um, and, and make sure they all are good at different things. 
So that I, I would attribute a lot to that. Yes. All right. So that's uh, growth hack number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can see uh, someone asked question, a question about growth hacks. Uh, let's 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 add a, one or two more. We'll move on, and maybe we might get back to you know anything else that comes to your mind when it comes to sort of the you know the team. Let's focus on the team first and uh, the marriage. The you know four co-founders of big marriage. What else, what, 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 what did you do to make it work? Uh, what else did we do to make it work? Uh, uh, well, Pancakes I mean, at 3 a.m., right? Don't, don't get the marriage thing wrong, right? So I think it's just like it just, you're spending 10 hours a day, 14 hours a day, or however long it takes yeah. every single day, including weekend, right? Because you can't really switch off. Yeah. Um, what else did we do? I think um, um, listening. Um, understanding what doesn't work, and if it doesn't work, don't be too stubborn about it. Like, it's important that you follow your vision and that you have a dream and that you pursue it, but if it doesn't work and you have to adjust it, then adjust it. Um, there's a lot of people who, I don't know, for 10 years stick in, do the same thing, um, uh, it doesn't work, uh, they're not changing anything and they keep getting the same results. That won't work. Um, we we changed quite substantially and, and quite often. And once we found a thing that worked, whenever we saw something new that could potentially work, we actually had to hold ourselves back. We said, no, we have something now. We're not going to change again, right? That's the next startup. Well, that's different people. We're just going to stick to it. But I think that ability to listen and change is super important. Um, and yeah, so... Um, I think you want to get started, take the first step, then make sure that you don't stop, you take the next and the next and the next and you adjust course. Right? If you never stop running and you allow yourself to change course towards the goal that you want to be at, then eventually you'll get there. What was the goal that you wanted to be at? Well, that's an interesting, I shouldn't have said that, right? Um, <laughs> I think we just wanted to build something different. Um, and, and so, yeah, if I look at uh, the, uh, you know, so I finished my master's degrees 21 years ago and PhD 17 years ago or so, and, and I ended up at, um, um, at a very large enterprise software company, um, uh, the same one that Marek was in. Uh, and back then, we, we've seen that we could effectively innovate. We could build new products, new ideas. We could get customers excited. But we were doing it inside a business that, um, uh, where it was extraordinarily difficult to get these things to market. And eventually we were realizing that we can do it, but um, we were basically fighting against other people inside the company rather than the competition. And um, you just realize you spend all this energy and you're wasting it because you're not getting anywhere with it. Like, uh, and that was a soul crushing experience, I think, back then. We thought like, okay, well, there's all this energy. What are we doing with it? And we, were just, we just wanted to do this outside and see how far we can get. I don't think anyone had the outcome that we've been getting in mind. Um, so, uh, but as you're growing, we, before the acquisition, we went close to 100 people. You realize at some stage, there's, there's a significant new thing here that a lot of people depend on now. Um, and it's only then when you, when you pause and you end up in the discussions that we ended up in with Microsoft, um, that, um, that you realize, hey, we've achieved something, but I don't think anyone had that as a plastic goal when we started. We just, we just kept going and didn't stop. And so, so what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you basically made sure that, that the journey was, was something that was exciting and the destination was almost secondary, right? It was not that, oh, let's just suck it up and you know, after 10 years we'll, we'll get a payout. Uh, hopefully, it was more, you know, let's, let's do something that we're enjoying every day. Yeah, I don't think you can get to, to there if you say, okay, well, I'm going to treat this as a 10-year project and I'm, I'm having the vision of having a payout, then you're not building something of value. So we always thought, like, uh, a lot of investors always want to know, what's your exit strategy? Like, what do you want to do? And we were always like, we don't know. We just want to build something valuable. We want to build something that people use, right? And... And if we can build something valuable, we will find some way to exit this. Um, but we didn't have a, a specific goal. And I think if you, if you too early on go like, well, I'm building something with the goal of being acquired, well, maybe it works for some people, but you certainly, if, if that particular thing then fails, you don't have a second, you don't have a plan B. 
Um, and, and so for us, it was always like, let's just build the most valuable experience that we can build for users. And surely if it's valuable, um, someone will, will notice and something interesting or amazing will happen with it. We, but we didn't really have a concept of what. Were you strategically um, thinking about Microsoft at some stage, you know, and, and did you sort of take steps to raise their interest specifically, or, 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 or was Microsoft one of a lot of organizations that could potentially be, you know, the, the um, acquiry? Yeah, so, sorry, yes. Yeah, we we um, I'm just I'm just thinking about what's public knowledge here. Um, <laughs> we we had a very close relationship with Google, and the reason I can say this is that everyone who would have gone into any retail store in the world and checked out a Google Chromebook would have seen ClipChamp on it. Um, we we also um, and that's probably something that the tech savvy amongst you can debug yourself. We're we're using quite a bit of Google technology in our product. So we had a much, much closer relationship to Google than we had with, with Microsoft. Um, and there were certainly other companies that wanted to buy us outside of Microsoft. Um, we gravitated towards Microsoft because there was a view that um, that's the journey that makes both the pre-acquisition uh, uh, journey that we had and the post-acquisition journey the most exciting one. Um, Microsoft's a company that acquires um, uh, you know, many companies a year, and uh, with a very long-term view, they think in decades, and we thought, like, um, that's really the most interesting for us because uh, there's not going to be any immediate pressure to deliver something next month or in two months, but we can take the time, build a fundamentally good product, and, and have one of the biggest uh, distribution uh, networks in the world at our disposal. So that was really the attraction. Um, but we had nothing to do with Microsoft before, no. Mm. So I, I had my moment of excitement. So just for everyone, and Alex alluded to it already, we, we've known each other for, I think, close to 15 years now or so. And we, we worked at, for at least two um, employers at roughly the, at the same time. So we, we would usually have a chance to have this conversation about, uh, you know, about business and what's happening. I was very excited. I think it was about a year and a half ago when Microsoft had their, their big event. I think it was introducing a new operating system. You would remember better than I do. Uh, but I remember they were showing their application store, the online app store, and ClipChamp was there. And that was so cool to see you know your your logo as one of those that were you know that, that that were showing up there. I think you guys were very excited in the office where you saw that, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's not an open question, right? So let's. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, short answer. Then. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's try with uh, um, uh, something else then. Uh, and and uh, I see uh, there is a there, there was a question that I found uh, found pretty interesting on my screen, uh, on our screen here. Uh, when did you decide, you yourself, when did you decide to go full time with, with this thing, right? I understand there was a bit of a transition uh, period. I understand you had to make a decision, right? You had to terminate yeah. your contract or whatever the, you know, the process was. Yeah. Um, so we, we started the whole thing in, in 2013 and it was grueling in the beginning because it was all nighttime. Like we had, um, uh, we had our day jobs and um, uh, I, was, uh, I was an associate professor at QUT back then. I was teaching large-scale units. I had about 1,000 students per year, and um, I was um, uh, you know, driving digital strategy and what have you. So the day job was quite demanding, and, uh, and, and we literally, like, Monday morning lectures, you, I created them on Sunday, so you work outside hours, and then at night you're trying to put as much as you possibly can into the startup and, and a bunch of young kids um, uh, in the mix as well. So um, that was really complicated. And we couldn't back then really afford to go full time before we had secured capital. Um, the first capital raise then that we closed was in 2016. And that was the time when we thought like, okay, well, now's, now's an opportunity that we can actually do this. Uh, so I handed in my resignation to uh, one of the safest positions uh, on the planet. Um, which is an academic um, at a good university. Um, my wife uh, at the time did the same thing. She was a high school teacher and she decided that's it. I'm going to become a children's book illustrator. So we went from two um, meaningful salaries to uh, no meaningful salary. 
um, with three kids about to hit their teenage years. So that was really, really interesting. Um, and obviously financial security was a big driver, so we had to wait until we raised our first round of capital and take a hit. So we sat down with our kids and explained to them that it's camping from now on and no more holiday houses and uh, interesting time. This, this, this all sounds well, sounds pretty scary to be to be to be very very honest. Uh, you know that the decision in life, right, to get rid of two salaries. I'm saying that as a professor at QUT. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I I think I have a different um, attitude towards risk than other people. Mm. Likely. Yeah. Mm. Um, about this story of Klipchamp, I understand there's a, a bit of a connection to State Library that uh, that not many people are aware of, that th those spaces are quite familiar to you guys from the early days, is that right? That's right, yeah, we try to obviously keep the um, uh, keep the day jobs and, uh, and the startup really apart, so, you know, we didn't want to use any QT facilities, equipment, time, in order to get um, uh, the startup work done. So we uh, did our first company meetings uh, at those meeting rooms that you can book here at the State Library. Um, it was really uh, super cool back then. Um, back then we didn't know what a board meeting was. Like, you know, it's just, oh, okay, so everyone's a director. Should we take notes or is it <laughs> you're making this up as you go, right? But yeah, it all happened right uh, in those meeting rooms up there. Um. And, and so, uh, perhaps uh, uh, around this, is there any regret to not keep uh, Klipchamp bootstrapped? Uh, so, uh, to sort of uh, uh, explain the jargon, right, you, you could have just basically run it, not get acquired, kind of like what Canva does in a relatively sort of similar creative space, right? They, they still get, uh, get funding from, from venture capital, but, uh, and I guess bootstrap is going even further than that. So, no, just answer the question. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, the way I interpret bootstrapping is uh, not taking capital in, yeah. and whoever asked the question, like, correct me if that's wrong. That's, that's, um, that's why I stopped, that's right, yeah, go yeah, for so, it, yes. So, no, I don't regret taking capital in. I, I think it makes life harder with um, uh, unsophisticated investors who don't really know what this is, and they're just hearing from friends, okay, well, let's just do this thing, this might be cool. But you're also getting a lot of unpleasant questions, and um, there's just generally not a good understanding of tech. Uh, sometimes in the investor basis at a later stage, but you have to do this in order to move forward, in order to hire your first employees, unless you want to fund the whole thing yourself, right? Um, so no, I don't regret a single dollar that we took in, and as you progress more and as you become more sophisticated, you attract better investors. So from round two, uh, when Steve then finally came on board, he missed the first round. Um, well, actually, this, the round zero that we tried to raise, we didn't um, after we got knocked back from him. Round, round one, we approached him, he didn't want to. Uh, round two, he finally engaged. But that was the time when you start realizing that there's so much value that investors bring as well. And then um, the last round that we raised was uh, with an American lead investor who had a, a very strong track record in, in uh, growing fantastic uh, software as a service businesses. And, you don't get to that stage unless you're going through the, um, through the early stages and unless you grow. Um, the view is always that you, uh, your, your slice in the pie gets smaller, but the overall pie gets much, much bigger. Uh, and from that perspective, it just checks out. Now, um, don't take this as an advice if you're creating a startup because you do give up preference shares. You, you, if your startup doesn't develop the way you want, you suffer more. So you brought up Canva. Counter example is uh, other startups that, um, that go bankrupt over this, right? Or they have to raise at a lower valuation and it goes, it goes south from there. Um, uh, it's a double-edged sword, but I don't regret a single dollar that we took in, no. Thank you. Um, what made uh, Microsoft interested in ClimChat? What was the single hook? That was the question. Uh, uh, can I still see it? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what was the single hook? Chris is asking this question. What was the single hook that engaged Microsoft? Yeah. Um, well, obviously it was a cool platform and it worked, right? <laughs> um, and uh, it was built uh, on a very innovative stack. And, um, and people back then, uh, we very often uh, had the same reaction when 
people have seen video editing platforms before, like if you have seen Adobe products or even iMovie or Final Cut Pro on Apple, um, you kind of get what a video editor is. So here's yet another one, so what, right? Um, but when people peel back and understand how we build it, which was distinctively different, um, which made it work on Google Chromebooks, which made it work for everyone in the browser, um, doesn't require huge hardware resources, et cetera, then people were quite, um, the, the reaction was always the same. You can do this, really? Um, that must have been part of the appeal and just the fact that it worked and that it spread so rapidly and that we had these uh, very high user ratings on Trustpilot. I think our average was 4.5-ish 4. 4 or something across uh, thousands of reviews. Um, there was just a lot of sentiment out there that the way we went about it and what we built worked, um, which probably has drawn the attention. There's a, there's a car that uh, we often see on our way to school when I take my kids, and it has a Clipchamp sticker on it. <laughs> um, uh, it's a Skoda. You might know whose car it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever my daughter sees that car, she shouts, Clipchamp! <laughs> she, she loves the app. She, she, she uses it all the time, you know, takes her videos and, you know, and plays with it. She's not a paying user, though, so I'm not sure. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Probably we, change that. Yeah. We, we can work on that. Um, that's why I was asking you uh, a bit earlier about the Microsoft, uh, you know, how it works with everything else. But that's not my question. Uh, I, I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm wondering myself, I mean, the, the startup uh, is here in Queensland, right? Uh, you started here, you continue here. From what I understand, there's no plans for the team to suddenly be lifted and shifted to, uh, to Seattle or so. It seems like you are staying around. Is this a good deal for Queensland, what's happening right now? I know you cannot disclose the uh, acquisition numbers, but is there like, does, does it change anything in Queensland? Yes, it's a very good deal for Queensland. And sometimes, you know, part of me wishes I could uh, just, you know, outline what the benefits to Queensland are, um, but I won't and I can't. Um, uh, I have no intention to move anywhere. Um, I, uh, made my choice, we came here, we love it here. So there's absolutely no reason to go anywhere else. Uh, I think a lot of um, Australian founders do the opposite, like when they have an opportunity to move to the US, they take it. Um, but we already made a very deliberate choice to, to get settled here. So, and I've already lived in the US and I didn't find it that attractive. So at the end of the day, I wanna, um, I wanna stick around and keep building this thing here. Um, when it comes to the future of the organization, um, we're obviously part now of a very large organization. Um, you know, there's, uh, plans can always change, um, uh, but I certainly, from a private perspective, won't be moving anywhere, no. Excellent. No, that's, look, that's very refreshing, and, uh, and I think both of us are in this um, um, sort of mindset that, you know, it's a, it's a really good place to, uh, to do great things. So, so Alex, thank you for, uh, you know, for making sure that, that uh, you guys stay here. Um, I said refreshing, and there's a question from Anonymous. Uh, how do you keep fresh and keep learning? So as a, as a person, as a founder, <laughs> must be uh, must be extremely exhausting to be, I know the answer to this question, but my, my must be extremely exhausting, you know, working with a US, uh, yep. Washington-based uh, um, uh, organization. How do you keep fresh? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. Uh, I think there's job descriptions for, when you have the title CEO, there's a job description for that, right? Um, and and you, you're expected to do a certain number of things in any organization, and, and Vicky, correct me if, if I'm wrong here, but when you're a startup CEO, your job description is you do everything that you don't have specialized people for, which in the beginning is everything. When we started with two people, uh, we had Zern building technology and I did everything else. Um, I did finance up until we were 40 people. I did daily bookkeeping, I did um, hiring, I did, um, well, I, well, everything. Everything that you don't have a dedicated person for. Now, um, um, you can not do it, then it doesn't get done, and likely you're failing, um, or you can do your best. And if you wanna do your best, you kind of have to uh, kind of learn it. I mean, <laughs> it's just like, what else are you going to do, right? So you go into Xero, and then what is this? Like, 
oh, which button do I need to push? What happens if I push, push this button? Every now and then it gets wrong. Uh, and then you have to rectify it. Um, yeah, which all the accounting colleagues here in the, in the front can attest. But um, so, yeah, sometimes it's very painful and you make mistakes. Um, the most complicated, difficult mistakes are all people related when you, when you realize you get the wrong people on board. Um, and you have to change that. Uh, there's, uh, in startups, or there's generally that saying, um, hire slow, fire fast. Uh, I dare say a lot of people don't know what that means until you experience what that means. Um, so those are the most costly mistakes that you can make. Um, but you're learning and you're adjusting your hiring practices um, as with everything else. So the, the main driver is really like there's, there's workload that has to be done that no one else will do. So I just have to do it. Okay. As simple as that. Right? So you're keeping fresh because you have to stay fresh. There's yeah. no other choice. There's no other choice. Uh, the growth hacks moment. Uh, uh, I, I remember, I think, you know, you used to walk a lot. Is that right? 10 kilometers a day? Was this then? Then do you still do it? Did you do it? Am I making it up? <laughs> No, you're not making it up. Um, it's very difficult when you've done competitive sports in the past to do anything recreationally, I guess. So <laughs> the minute you do, so, the minute I do something that I can track, it, it gets unhealthy in, in that I'm going like, how can I do more of this faster, right? Um, so yes, I was doing between 10 and 20K every single day, mm -hmm. weekday, um, during the pandemic until I messed up my knee and needed surgery. So, so I'm not doing it anymore. Um, but I'm trying to get back into it. Um, so um, that's not the growth hack question, though, right? Uh, well, I thought it was. I think it was more about a personal, you know, how do you stay on top of your game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that was really helpful, yeah. I mean, it's um, so I used to work uh, to work and walk back. Um, the good thing about this is really you can mentally disassociate and keep private and professional apart and um, think about what happened. Um, uh, sometimes take calls, so that doesn't work then. Um, but yeah, so I think staying fit and healthy, sleeping well and stuff like that, I think that's, um, that's all mandatory, mm. like otherwise you won't go the mile. Th thanks, Alex. Uh, you're right. Uh, there was an interesting question from the audience about your strategy. Did you first focus on building a product or did you focus on building market first? So I guess the way I understand this question, was it more of a minimum viable product uh, approach where you try to test the market or you actually said, no, let's build something that we're already proud of and let's try to gain users. I think it's fair to say that we started from a technology perspective. Um, we built something that was difficult to build because we could. And then we were trying to understand what can we do with it. So the distributed supercomputing thing was um, the realize, realization that we can build um, powerful video technology in the browser in a way it hasn't been done before. Um, and so this was what Zuren said, we can do this, uh, but why would we? And so it took me a few months then to go like, this is what we can do with it, right? And I did all the maths and built all the Excel spreadsheets and came up with, this could potentially make sense. Um, and when it then didn't, uh, then we took the next step, but it was always driven like, okay, well, here's what we could do next. And then we try to retrofit from a product perspective, does that make sense? And that went on until we were about 15 people, believe it or not. And it was only at that point in time where we pr introduced more deliberate product management, where we started more talking to users um, uh, and, and went more like, okay, well, how do we get the quantitative and the qualitative data in order to derive a meaningful direction for where we're going. Um, but yeah, that happened later. In the beginning, we were really more technologically driven and motivated by, hey, let's build something that no one else has ever done. If you were doing it again, would you do it in the same order? The well, same I didn't way? know any better, so yeah. Uh, no, if, no, I would if, do it if, now? You, if you were to do it again. Uh, you mean starting now again? Yes, yeah. let's, let's imagine, you know, uh, a totally imaginary scenario, you're starting a new startup. Yep. Would you start with technology or would you no. start with, no? No, no, okay. no, so you, that's probably that's a, a rookie, rookie mistake, yeah. I, I reckon we could have just almost like, uh, not do the first four years. Uh, if, <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, uh, it, was, it was very painful and we, we learned a lot, but, but then again, you know, if we hadn't done those four years, then we wouldn't have learned all the stuff that um, later on, 
uh, like I am trying to imagine doing negotiations with one of the largest corporations in the world without having had to go through all the stuff in the beginning that wouldn't have worked out well. Mm. Um, so no, I think now I would more go like, what, what is the problem that we're actually trying to solve? Um, you know, is, is there a problem out there? And then has anyone else tackled that problem and be a lot more deliberate about this um, with the experience that I've gained now? Mm. Uh, back then, yeah, we just didn't have that experience. And you know, back for the company that we worked for, we always geeked out on technology and we kept doing this. Um, yeah, I Still get fun. it. I get it. I, I, I think those first four years were actually quite enjoyable. I understand that, you know, maybe they were not needed. Um, uh, anonymous, uh, feel free to add your names if you add, uh, add questions to, uh, to Slido. Uh, anonymous is asking you to expand on your, your different attitude to risk. You know, I think it's after I mentioned that it's scary and then you said I have a different attitude to risk. Yeah, yeah. Well, dear dean of my faculty, I hereby resign. Um, you know, when you get a paycheck every two weeks, 17% uh, superannuation on top, or more. I don't even know what it was back then, but it, that's that's a uh, it's a difficult move when you don't really have a lot of savings. You don't own the house that you're living in. Um, you just basically became a citizen, so at least I can't kick you out of the country anymore. So uh, that was good. Uh, I think it's I think it's a tough choice that you have to make. Like, do I really want this, um, and and do I trust that whatever work that I'm putting in here is going to yield some sort of result? Um, and over the years, like uh, you know, every single capital round that you're in, every single backlash you're getting, every single um, you know wrong direction we took. Um, you start asking yourself that question again, what am I doing here and is this right? And for me, uh, what was always reassuring is that I didn't know what we're going to get out of this, but as we grew and as the team got bigger and as we had more and more users and more and more customers, I'm, I was always like, well, we're, if this all fails, I'll get a job, like some job. So that was always what, what kept me going, but in the beginning, that thought, like, the, you, you just, throw yourself into the deep end, right? And you have to do this, you have to go all in. Um, uh, I didn't, there was no back door back into QUT, so I really cut ties and that was it. There was no, okay, well, if this doesn't work out in a year or so, I'm back. Um, so we deliberately cut all ties and, and that's difficult, like I said, when, when you have three young kids, um, it's, it's difficult, so I don't, put your, like, would you take this decision? Would you, yeah? <laughs> Well, that's great. That's probably why you're sitting here. So I want, to con <laughs> I want to congratulate you, and I encourage you to do it. It's the best thing that can ever happen um, if it works out. Do you, make, uh, <laughs> do you make calculated decisions, or was it more of an instinctive sort of impulse decision? Who are you? I'm probably not the biggest planner in the world, so uh, mm. probably more impulsive. You felt, you felt it was right. You yep. felt it was the time to do it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Talk too long about it, and then at some stage you go like, "Let's just do this." So, uh, so anonymous uh, is. Uh, oh, sorry. I wanted to to thank you for using the metaphor of throwing yourself into the deep end. Uh, that shows that well, you spent a lot of time swimming. Clearly, uh, uh, anonymous uh, is asking uh, about that that moment when you realized that Microsoft was interested. Uh, I guess you know that. Was there a moment, or was it gradually build, building up? Um, yeah. Tell us about it. Um, yeah, there was a moment. Um, uh, so we were, we were going out raising a Series B round in early 2021, um, and I talked to about 40, 50 venture capitalists uh, in the US, all of them in the US. There was one Australian and, and the other in the US. Um, it was all during COVID, obviously, so it was all uh, at five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, you name it. Um, and we had some really spectacular discussions with them. We got to a bunch of term sheets, and, um, and at the same time, there was all up six companies that were interested in acquiring us. And, uh, and it was, a, a, amongst the founders, a very tough discussion, like, are we gonna go the capital round, or are we gonna go on acquisition? Right, and do you, do you take that opportunity now that it uh, comes up? And there was a certain point in time and we realized um, that this could be serious, but it's also an enormous risk that you take. Um, so for those of you who went through acquisitions before, 
Um, there's a process called due diligence where really every stone gets turned around and you try to understand whether everything is clean and all the records are in place, all the intellectual property is secured, there's no fraud. And there's, um, it's quite an investigation and it binds you for quite some time and it's a very resource intense uh, uh, process. Um, there's a lot of lawyers to be paid, so you take on uh, quite a substantial risk and we only really fully took on that risk once we understood that they uh, that they really wanted that, right? And that comes from a lot of discussions um, uh, with the stakeholders that we were negotiating with. And so how did it feel when, 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 when you took that risk? You know, did it feel good? Did, were, were you stressed? Uh, uh, we went very democratic about everything that we did. Um, so the, the 3 a.m. pancake mala uh, discussion or manner or whatever it's called, uh, in the city, um, that was when we made the choice, or made the decision to uh, finish everything that we're doing or repurpose everything that we're doing as transcodecentral.com. And it was a gut-wrenching discussion, and in the end it was two against one. So we were there with three people at 3 a.m. in the morning, we took a democratic vote, it was two against one, and we said we're going to do this democratically, uh, and because it was two against one, we kept going. The decision with Microsoft was again two against one. Um, so we had uh, two people who said, let's just do this, and one who said, uh, let's not do this. So when you're asking how did it feel, it felt differently for, mm. for us. So mm. for some of us, it was gut-wrenching, and for others, it was quite exciting. Mm. Um, mm. As with everything in startups, right, the good thing feels much better, and the bad things feels, feels, uh, feels uh, a lot worse. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's actually pretty interesting. I, I, I didn't realize that you know, not everyone was, was excited about the move, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, right where we are at the moment, everyone's happy, right? All the yeah, oh, we're super happy about it. But again, I mean, you've got, you got to have a decision process in place, right? And um, uh, what we didn't do, like very early on, um, the team, the founder teams decided on me being CEO. Um, but we immediately also said we're not going to this is not going to be a one-person show making all the decisions, right? So we're going, to, we're going to discuss things and we're going to agree things. And the agreement process that we had set up back then was let's do this in a democratic way, right? Mm, mm, mm. I, I wanted to take the, the top question from the, uh, from the screen that we have here uh, and ask about your children. What do, you, what do your children think about you? And do you think uh, professionally, uh, business-wise, uh, startup related, and do you think you're influencing their future life choices. Uh, so whoever asked this, so I don't know what, what your children think about your work, um, but usually what that does is boring. Um, uh, so I'm, I don't think I'm much different. Um, I told that story before. Uh, in the very large enterprise software company that we were working for, there were all these Christmas parties, fancy offices, and the kids were young and they were going in and there were foosball tables and, you know, it was quite exciting for them. And then at QT, we were at P Block, um, there was this big iPad and the kids were just running around and this is all cool. And, and then the first office that we had at Clipchamp, I was like, you know, at the Clipchamp, first Clipchamp shirt, right? And the kids were like, Clipchamp, what's that? And I said, well, that's the company now. This is so cool, right? You want to come see our offices, right? And it was a, a room at Christie Center with four desks in it. <laughs> and so I remember I opened the door, the kids storm in and they go like, that, that's not an office, that's a room with four desks, right? And um, so I guess for the first four years, they were very unexcited. Um, and then later on, as they saw it coming together, I think some of the pivotal, pivotal point in times were when um, our daughter had one of her best friends and she was using Clipchamp. And my daughter had never really talked about this. So it's like, oh, what? Like, my friend does what my dad builds? That's weird. Like, um, so maybe it's not that horrible. Um, so it was gradually a process like that. Um, well, I hope. I hope and I'm trying to encourage them to uh, you know, take their lives into their own hands and um, don't waste it and build something. Um, whether they do it or not, who knows, right? Mm. Is this hope that um, you know, they'll take it into their hands and build something, is it also expanding beyond your family? So sort of providing a segue to another question about you, the co-founders, now supporting other early stage entrepreneurs. Are you thinking about it, um, becoming an angel investor perhaps? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I 
I'm uh, super passionate about the startup ecosystem that we have here in Queensland and how it's been growing. Um, I remember uh, one of the very early things back in 2014, we attended a very small conference. I don't even know what it was anymore. And uh, we're standing there with uh, two interns and across the hall from me, there was Andy Barnes, um, you know, with Go One. Uh, they were a four-man show back then, uh, and um, you know we were just like, I was I was watching him all day long. He was quite bored. I was quite bored, and in the end, I was just walking over and like, hey, what are you doing? Um, yeah, it's quite exciting to run a startup in Queensland, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so so that kind of conversation, and just to see how that breed of companies from those early 2010s, like how many. Uh, super large companies, how many jobs have been created, um, not only in Queensland, but across the world, and the economic impact it creates for those early investors that are usually Australians, um, uh, the economic value that comes back to uh, the state through the investment uh, returns that they're getting is quite extraordinary. So I'm super passionate about this, and I think with um, the, the what we've seen over the last decade, the, the ecosystem has matured quite a bit from uh, both the entrepreneurs, the new entrepreneurs that are out there, as well as the investor base that's out there uh, and their understanding in software. So, yeah, I'm super passionate and I, I definitely want to and will stay involved in the startup ecosystem. Excellent. Is that an invitation for people to reach out to you every now and then? <laughs> of course. <yep. laughs> All right, let's have conversations. Uh, uh, did you have an advisory board? No. Um, we, uh, no, we didn't. We talked about it uh, many times, uh, and we always had the plan to build one. And it was always the thing that we're going to do next week, and then we never ended up doing it. Um, we had very strong board members uh, that provided a lot of advice, and we selectively brought people in when we needed them, um, say when we had specific challenges with objectives and key results or something like that. We looked for uh, some high-profile person that we could get in who would teach us um, but we didn't have a dedicated advisory board, no. Mm -hmm. um, d do you regret it? Do you think, uh, do you know, if you had a chance to do it again, you would want one? Uh, well, every, every decision you ever take, you take the best decision you possibly can make under all the information that you have. So I don't personally believe I've, I've made a bad decision because... Um, with every decision, you get either one of two outcomes. One is the one that you were hoping for, and the other one is the one that you're learning from. Um, so no, I don't regret a single thing. Um, what, like, I don't know what would have happened if we had an advisory board and they would have steered us in the wrong direction or in an even better direction. Um, uh, and there's no way to find out. So uh, I think we had an incredible run. And no, don't regret a single decision along the way. That's wonderful, and uh, just, I'm sure people were taking notes as much as I was just now about uh, every decision having one of the two outcomes, right? One that you are hoping for and one that you're learning from. Uh, well, well, we made it a cultural thing to never punish anyone for decision making. We encourage people. We have a very high degree of autonomy in our teams. Um, we're running cross-functional um, squads that basically uh, every squad consists of product uh, a product manager, product um, a developer, a designer, uh, sorry, a product manager, a designer, a growth marketer, and a bunch of software engineers. And we encourage them through objectives and key results to take their own decisions and decide what they're doing that contributes to a larger goal. And we, we specifically encourage them to take decisions. And no one ever got punished in the company for taking the wrong decision. That's, um, we really, this is a learning journey. Um, we're building something we're building a technology that hasn't been built before. We're building it as a startup from Brisbane with people that have never done this. Um, so you can't really rely on experience. The only thing you can rely on is that you take people on board that want to learn, that show an aptitude and a willingness and a hunger for learning, and then you take them on a learning journey, right? Wonderful. And, and, uh, and is Brisbane, is Queensland a good place to find people like that? Oh, yes. Um, I didn't think so in the beginning, um, but it really comes down to understanding um, people's potentials rather than experience. Um, so you want to, you want to, uh, we, and we made that point early on: is that we um, we try to find people that were showing that we can, um, they can achieve what we want them to achieve, not at the time that they're starting, but by the time they're a year in or something like that. 
Uh, a great example was um, QT Code Network, uh, which was a bunch of students that uh, were bought by the curriculum, um, part of which uh, I was uh, <laughs> back when I was at QT. Um, uh, and, and they got together on Friday nights to challenge themselves and do something more interesting. And that group very quickly escalated from 20 to 800. Uh, and we recruited a bunch of students from that pool that are all now mid or senior developers uh, and, and really made a, a significant contribution uh, to, to the company. Um, so um, you, you find these people here and there are troves of them. I think Australia has also a very high number of small businesses. It's so easy to set up a business here. Everyone goes like how friendly the US is in terms of setting up a business. Well, we did. It's, it's horrible <laughs> compared to <laughs> what we have here, right? So ClipChamp took three days, you know, three nights at the couch. You know, you just go, you register business, you get an ABN, you just do all of these setup things and you have a fully registered business. Much, much harder in other countries, right? So I think it's easy to set up. You find right good people here. Don't, if, unless you look for people that have spent 10 years at Facebook, Google and Microsoft or something like that, that's more, that's harder to find. Mm. Thanks, Alex. We have to wrap up uh, any minute now, but I, I still wanted to ask you one last question that I saw popping up somewhere uh, on the, in the feed as well. Uh, reflecting on the 3,120 days of, uh, of ClipChamp uh, prior and up to the point of acquisition, uh, what was the darkest hour and what was the brightest hour? <laughs> darkest? Oh. Uh. Darkest is all people related, I suppose. Like when you, uh, when you, um, you know, when you realize you made wrong decisions and you see how, how uh, well, I just said like there are no wrong decisions. When you realize you made decisions that aren't conducive to the outcome that you wanted and they're people related and you have to, uh, you have to intervene there, that is just not fun. And it has never been fun and it will never be fun. Um, um, happiest? Oh, I don't, there's so many different, there's so many little wins. Um, uh, it's difficult to say, and um, uh, it's not that the biggest wins feel the best, it's sometimes smaller things. Like I remember very distinctively, we, in 2014, we did one growth hack where we put Gro uh, ClipChamp into the Google Chrome Web Store um, for it to be discovered uh, by people, and that was our technologists who had the best growth idea back then, right, which, which was interesting. And, um, and we were sitting there and all of a sudden there was a review and, um, and the first review was someone in the team and then the second review came in and we're like, um, who's this person? Like, is, is it one of your friends, one of the family? And we looked around in the room, no one knew this person. I said, did someone just leave a review after testing us? And then the next day there was another one and then a week later there was uh, someone said, um, they're a teacher in the US and we effectively built the big fat recording button that Google forgot to build. And we're like, what? Um, this works on Chromebooks, so we went to JB Hi-Fi and bought a Chromebook and it worked and all of a sudden we realized we had solved a problem for the US education sector, uh, K-12. to That was just so cool. Now it's got nothing to do with what we do today, but back then that just felt incredibly cool because that was the first time we saw traction and within weeks we were in the tens of thousands of users. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Alex for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to once again uh, thank our Auslan interpreters and apologies for all the accent and all the you know funny words that we used. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the time's up for us, Alex. We have to leave the stage now, and I wanted to hand over to Professor Amanda Goodmanson. Can I say one more word? My wife's never worked at ClipChamp. I tried multiple times. She always said no. There was a question. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs>
and seeing how that has evolved from that, from that very early stage. But thank you, Alex, for your really generous and very thoughtful but honest reflection on what it's like to be a tech entrepreneur in Brisbane. And it's, it's wonderful that you've chosen to stay here and it's fantastic that your, your um, product and your business continues to grow and of course now with the, you know, the support of Microsoft. And thanks so much, Marek, for being here and for interviewing Alex. And I had no idea that the pair of you had worked for another organisation as well together in the past. So isn't it incredible, the six degrees of freedom and how that all comes together. Well, thank you, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening. Now, if you're interested in reviewing uh, tonight's conversation, remember you can go online into the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame website and pick up um, the webcast next week. Uh, so we've got another couple of game changers coming along for the rest of the year. So it's my pleasure to let you know that on August 11, we will um, be welcoming Stephen Page of the Bangara Dance Theatre as our game changer. So we move from tech entrepreneur to creative industries um, in August 11, so one not to be missed. We will then also have another game changer in October. Uh, at this stage, we're hoping to have uh, Juliet Wright from Give It, so we'll move to, um, to more of the, the social enterprise at that time of the year. So, of course, Game Changers is an initiative of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, which is a partnership between Queensland um, University of Technology Business School and the Queensland Library, State Library and the Queensland Library Foundation. I'd like to um, thank Vicky McDonald, CEO um, of the State Library of Queensland, for um, welcoming us here this evening and to uh, share these fantastic surroundings um, with us um, tonight. I'd also like to thank um, the events team from the State Library and from QUT um, for their work in helping to um, ensure that all of this um, uh, runs well as it always does. Thank you and to our interpreters um, from Ausland. Um, we hope to welcome you back here uh, in August, so please, um, once again, thanks very much to Alex and to Marek for tonight's conversation, and I look forward to seeing you here again really soon. Safe travels and good evening. <laughs>